I'm going to bring on our first three guests, and those are the filmmakers of and protagonists of the great film Israelism. Aaron Axelman is a queer Jewish filmmaker based out of Massachusetts. They are the co-director and producer of Israelism, which is their directorial debut. Sam Ellerston is the co-director and director of photography of Israelism. They are the co-founder of Tikkun Alam Productions and the director of the upcoming projects Generation Green New Deal and Versus Goliath. Simone Zimmerman, one of the protagonists of the film, is a progressive Jewish activist originally from Los Angeles. She is a co-founder of If Not Now, the former head of Beth Salem U.S., and currently works with Diaspora Alliance on issues of anti-Semitism and Palestinian rights. So welcome. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having us. Of course. So I thought so that everyone was on the same page and the audience had some context for this discussion, we could start off by showing a trailer for Israelism. American okay. Jews who come here say, we came to Israel and we left from Palestine. The non-Jewish community does not understand our obsession with Israel. I went to a Jewish day school. Summer camp, organized trips to Israel. <laughs> Israeli soldiers, they're hot, they're awesome, they're strong. We actually have had quite a few of our former students join the idea. And these are kids, these are 18, 19 year olds. Amazing. I told my parents I don't even need to apply to college. I'm gonna just join the Israeli military. 10% of my graduating class joined the Israeli army. We were deployed to the West Bank. I don't think I realized the extent to which what I would come to see on the ground would really shock me and horrify me. When people look at the West Bank today and say, this is an apartheid system, it's not just throwing out a word. Palestinians live in day in, day out without experiencing a day of freedom. You see what non-democracy looks like. What we've been told is that the only way that Jews can be safe is if Palestinians are not safe. The more I learned about that, the more I came to see that as a lie. Within the Jewish community, oh, there's been a striking change. They're really angry at the way they were indoctrinated, justifiably so. When we talk about we're losing the kids, uh, we're not, we lost them. I think they're a little super naive. Anytime you cut against the grain, you're gonna catch hell. You are a self-loathing Jew. Go kill yourself. An anti-Semitic Jew. The way that we talk about anti-Semitism isn't about protecting Jews, it's about protecting Israel. How dangerous is that? They will do anything to preserve unconditional support for Israel. The great irony is that there actually is a resurgent anti-Semitism. History is not going to judge us kindly. Tell us what made you want to do the film and how it came about. Yeah, so I can answer this one quickly. And then, you know, it's partly based, obviously based on Simone's story and in some ways inspired by Simone too. Um, it's very roughly based off my own story and very much the story of many of my friends. Uh, I didn't grow up in a Jewish day school, but Israel really became the center of my Jewish identity. It really became my way of connecting with Judaism and with my Jewish community. And I became a passionate Zionist and kind of pro-Israel supporter. Um, but then like many American Jews, came into contact with Palestinian narratives um, and realized that the stories I kind of followed you know, I, I had many ways fallen in love with were not the whole story, right? I had kind of missed huge parts of the narrative, primarily the Palestinian experience and the Palestinian narrative. Um, and when I got to college, I saw so many people who, like myself, had grown up kind of unconditionally supportive of Israel, loving Israel, but had virtually no contact with Palestinian narratives and certainly not Palestinian people. Um, but they eventually did come into contact with Palestinians and similarly began to learn that the narratives they had kind of been inculcated with were not the full story. Um, and to their credit, began to listen and to be, and began to change. So I had the kind of initial idea. And then as we were in the very early um, production, if not, we kind of became aware of if not now and realized that kind of their mobilization and the, and the work they were doing really represented the generational changes we were interested in showing. We heard about Simone very early on. I had friends in college who did work with Simone um, and we realized that she was you know, incredibly inspiring and that her work really represented a lot of what we were trying to show and her transformation as well really represented what we were trying to show. So we got in contact with Simone and that was many years ago at this point, it took us about seven years and, and here we are now. And what was your aha moment? Did you have one, Erin? 
Yeah, it was in high school. Um, I was I went to a public high school in rural Maine, and I um, was doing uh, you can do an independent study in my high school, and I was doing a year long independent study on whatever you wanted, and the end result was making a short documentary and. I was going to do one of the history of Israel, and obviously it was going to be a very pro-Israel documentary. And my teacher, this amazing kind of progressive hippie guy, either Jewish or Palestinian, at one point, you know, just asked me, just said, you know, do you know anything about Palestinian history? And because the narratives I talked about barely mentioned Palestinians at all, I said, no, I, I don't know anything about Palestinian history. It wasn't threatening. I just literally didn't know. And so over the course of this year, he gave me all of these, um, you know, history books, primarily left-wing Israelis as well as Palestinians. Um, Edward Said um, and the Rishi Khalidi were really important to me. And kind of the veil was lifted, and I realized that the pro-Israel narrative was in many ways very similar to the pro-American narrative, and that it was this kind of heroic, almost mythical tale of creating a new state, um, but didn't include the people who lived there before um, and totally erased um, the people whose, um, you know, self-determination uh, was, you know, came at the expense of. And so you were already aware of that prop being propaganda for the U.S., but not for Israel? Yes. Yeah. And it was was quite shocking. You know, I was always, there was a lot of kids in my public high school who went to the American military. And I was kind of like always shocked that, that they would do that. But I thought going to the Israeli military was a normal and amazing thing. And when I kind of made the connection um, that they were in many ways quite similar, um, that was a, a big aha moment for me. And what about you, Sam and Simone? I didn't grow up with a totally one-sided narrative about um, Israel and Palestine. Um, I think I mostly grew up with the narrative of like, it's a conflict and both sides have done bad things right. and kind of like a complicated both sides is it's complicated yeah. um type narrative um but aaron and i went to college together and so we both sort of um saw this kind of transformation like i, I have a good friend who um came to when he first came to school he would like always wear his israeli military uh shirt that he like got when he visited an army base um in high school and you know now he's very pro-Palestinian. And, and that was kind of very, very common story um, among our, our Jewish peers and kind of informed making the film. I guess the beginning of my journey was my freshman year of college. I thought I was going to do Israel advocacy. I joined the APAC group at my campus. And um, over the course of that year, I had like a series of experiences where I, I ran out of talking points. I just like, I kept getting into these arguments um, I, I, the, the first time I ever, you know, argued about Israel at school, I remember I got into this like super heated, really detailed conversation about all the issues with a, a friend of mine. And I was like, yeah, here I go. I'm pulling out the talking points. One, two, three, like I got them. And then I, I ran out and that was really awkward because she still had more questions. And I was like, oh my God, I, I used up all the talking points. I don't know what else. I mean, in, you know, at the time I didn't think of them as talking points, but, right. um, I, and, and so it was, it, it, it was a series of encounters like that, where I was like, why don't I know about this thing? Why don't I know the answer to this question? What is this thing that this person is asking me about? Sounds kind of bad. And, um, you know, and then like reading there and going and going back to the community and saying like, what is this thing? Is it so bad that you can't bear to have us see it? And then like, the answer is, yeah, it is that bad. And they don't, they can't, they themselves can't bear to look at it let alone let us look at it. So We interviewed Gideon Levy on the other show that I host, My Useful Idiots, and one of the things he said is like, there are three things that need to happen for Israel to be able to live with the occupation, and it's Israelis to be able to live with the occupation, feeling like the chosen people, seeing yourself as victims, and the dehumanization of Palestinians, which mm. obviously you can't really be okay yeah. with what Israel is doing, unless you see them as, as ne less than human. Talk about what the reaction to the film has been like. I know that a lot of people have uh, canceled screenings. They've tried to cancel successful. screenings. Okay, yeah, they've been successful. Okay. Basically, no, no. It's yeah, it's been very interesting. I mean, you know, obviously after October seventh, a lot of people were in a deeply emotional state, which we were as well. And I think people really wanted to do something and wanted to, you know, fight a very real anti-Semitism. Obviously, that that's, that's surging across the world. But uh, people began thinking that our film was anti-Semitic. Um, which is pretty wild considering that our film is made by an entirely Jewish team and talks very much about the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, but because our film criticizes Israel, some kind of on the far right began labeling our film as anti-Semitic. And then people began thinking, oh, you know, how can I fight anti-Semitism? I can try to cancel the Israelism film without actually watching the film or really knowing what it's about. So a lot of the colleges um, and theaters we've been doing screenings at have received you know, 10 to 50,000 emails, automated emails telling them to cancel the film and saying that our film is dangerous for Jewish people. You know, it's made by Jews and the great majority of student groups and professors bringing us to campus or organizing theatrical screenings are Jewish too. So it's it's very kind of, I think, 
um, it really helps kind of clarify the very confused moment that a lot of people are having about what anti-Semitism really is and what's actually threatening versus just what are uncomfortable truths um, that we have to actually confront. So, but the actual screenings themselves have been remarkably normal. I mean, they've been oftentimes really cathartic spaces for both Jewish and Palestinian students um, and community members. So the events have been amazing. And, you know, interest in our film is really surging, but there's also this kind of quite bizarre um, campaign to make our film seem dangerous to Jewish people. Did the um, the screening at Hunter happen yet? It did. It did. Okay, because I know that they were trying to cancel it. Yeah, so basically they, um, the president of Hunter uh, canceled the screening the day that it was going to happen. Um, this was early November, and she sent a, um, having not seen the film, she sent, uh, released a public statement um, that they weren't going to show the film because uh, it's a da- this is a dangerous time for Jewish students and um, and sort of implying that, again, that the film was anti-Semitic and even, um, you know, she she mentioned as an example of anti-Semitism, like people drawing swastikas on buildings. And so it's sort of like implicitly putting us in the same category as as people drawing swastikas on buildings, which is incredibly um, offensive to us and hurtful. Um, fortunately, the reaction um, was that students protested and uh, the faculty union voted to condemn the decision. Um, the Hunter College Senate voted to condemn the decision, and they did reinstitute the screening. Um, and it, it happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, unfortunately, the president, um, sort of at the last minute, like excluded the Arabic Studies Department, which was original co-sponsor um, of the screening, um, from being able to have their name on it, which we were not happy about. Um, we're hoping that we can. Uh, do another screening in in next semester um, that includes them. That's disgusting. Sorry. I mean, I don't mean to put you in an awkward position because yeah. maybe you're on good terms now with this president. But We're not on great terms. You're really shameful and racist. <laughs> yeah. You're really suggesting that Arabic studies, that's what it is, the department, Arabic studies. Like you're suggesting that Arabic studies are inherently anti Semitic. So I say you're a Shonda. Yeah. I mean, just also like, on top of that, a lot of the professors in Arabic studies are Jewish. 